It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we're delighted to be here this week. Thank you, everyone who's been following this teaching for, what, going on three years? I think so. A long, yeah. long time. Please um, take advantage of our mobile, our, well, our, our free mobile, app. We yes. call it a mobile app, but actually it's more than that because it's also available for Roku and Apple TV, mm -hmm. but it bypasses the, uh, the, gatekeepers. the gatekeepers. The The mobile version of the app for your phone and tablet does have a uh, Bible um, module on it, uh, a calendar of our upcoming events and much more. Got our blog. Some of the things that we've written in the past will be released through the blog. So you're getting uh, excerpts from uh, our past books uh, released there as mm -hmm. well. So you'll find the link at gilberthouse.org slash app. So yeah, thank you very much. We were digging into a Revelation 16 last week and got, as we normally do, we didn't get very far, got through a few verses, <laughs> but uh, we're going to pick up on that this week. And uh, after the break, we will talk about our trip to Israel. So hang in there Coming for that. Coming up very soon. Yeah. Um, one, one of the most interesting things last week was your observation that the bowls being poured out is a reversal of an ancient pagan ritual that we know from texts found in Mesopotamia. I Go think back it is. Centuries before Abraham, mm -hmm. the idea that you had to summon what were believed to be the spirits of the ancestors through a necromancy ritual mm -hmm. every month and then feed them and then give them drink by pouring out water or wine on yes. the ground to yes. sustain them in the afterlife. And so, as we mentioned last week, that is reversed in Psalm 23 and reversed mm -hmm. by the Lord's Supper. Right. So yes, he is now giving them what they deserve mm -hmm. through their own rituals. And seeing in the first three bowl judgments parallels with uh, not just the... Um, the trumpet judgments that had preceded them, but uh, some of the plagues that afflicted Egypt as well. And uh, this week we begin with the fourth bowl judgment, Revelation 16, beginning at verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. It's interesting, a couple of things in here. One is that there is a solar deity in the fallen realm right. identified by a number of names, sometimes male, sometimes female, mm -hmm. Shapash and Shemash. Shemash, Shemesh in Hebrew. There mm -hmm. is a Beth Shemesh that is not far from uh, ancient Hebron. <laughs> Excuse me. Every, every civilization has had a solar deity mm -hmm. and a lunar deity. Right. And as far back as uh, the book of Exodus, Moses was told by the Lord in well, Deuteronomy 4, uh, beginning of verse 19, Warn the Israelites not to bow down and worship the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven. Exactly. Things that God's allotted to the nations mm -hmm. for their inheritance. Mm -hmm. Those gods were to be worshipped by the other nations, but Israel was unique. They were to worship Yahweh and worship him alone. You know, there's a story that was in the news just this week as we're recording this. And uh, I think it's interesting because there are chemtrailing. <laughs> yes, yes efforts by a number of civilizations, East and West, to try to minimize mm -hmm. solar activity, yes. at least how it's received here on Earth, because it's too bright or it's too sunny or it's too hot. And so we, if we can find ways to do that, yeah, make your plants happy, block the sun. Mm -hmm. No, don't do that. But the <laughs> idea eliminate that... carbon dioxide, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, anthrop anthropocentric... Uh, climate change, mankind being responsible for it. That's been the story for decades now. And there are some who are now saying, even on the, the climate change side, that maybe we should look at the sun. 
maybe these solar cycles have something to do with the little ice age and then the really <laughs> warm ice, uh, you know, whatever. So how if we could just control the sun? Well, the Lord is coming along, and not only is he, not only is he uh, judging the sun, which is ironic because the solar deity is the judge mm -hmm. in the fallen realm, but he's also coming along at a time when climate change is all over the place, and right. oh, I'm going to take out part of the sun. Uh -huh. I'm going to take out his power. I'm going to make it hotter. Or I'm going to take because previously we saw that the sun did yes. not give its light. Right, it was blocked. Mm -hmm. Well, now he's scorching men with fire, mm -hmm. judging them and scorching them. And yet the judge is truly the Lord. And we see this in verse nine. They realize who's actually behind this. They do, and yet they don't repent. In fact, the uh, the Greek word, and I think the King James uses this word, is uh, blaspheme. Yes, God. That's a word we don't use as often anymore as we should, blasphemy. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, very much appropriate. Well, and then underlined in verse 9, in, in the KJV, it says, and men were, men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, the name of, uh, what, what is the word here? Adonai or Yahweh? Uh, it is... Uh, um, probably Adonai, which hath power Theo. over... Oh, the, the Greek God. Word, Theo. Theo. yeah which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Mm -hmm. They knew who was doing it, but underline, and they repented not. It almost implies, if only they would repent, mm -hmm. then things might change, but they repent not. And I would say it's not only the humans, it is the fallen realm. Mm -hmm. Before the flood, we're told that Enoch... In, in the book of Enoch, we're told that he visited the watchers and said, right. a flood is coming, it's going to kill your kids. And it's because of what you did mm -hmm. with humans. And they wept. Right. They had uh, petitioned God and had Enoch deliver the petition. Asking For their children. God not to punish them. And uh, Enoch's Enoch delivered God's response was, you should have prayed for these humans. Yes. Well, the, the Lord sent the message via mm -hmm. Enoch, did right. not go there personally because they asked, could he come here mm -hmm. so that we can plead with him? Right. Well, Jesus shows up yeah. after his uh, crucifixion and says, I didn't come to talk to you before, but I just want to let you know. Yeah. The answer is still no. The answer is still no. But what's interesting is that if we discussed this in the programs that we did about the book of Enoch and Jesus and the fact that he chose that very location, that region between the Sea of Galilee and mm -hmm. Mount Hermon to essentially base his ministry. And that's where these events took place. Scholars have identified the location where Enoch delivered God's judgment to the uh, weeping angels, oh. Avel Beth Ma'akah, which is a city mm -hmm. on the northern border of Israel. It's very close to the border between Israel and Lebanon today. There's an archaeological site there, and we'll be visiting that before our tour begins in March so we can shoot some video there. there but there's something about that because there are other extra-biblical texts from that Second Temple period that um, focus on that region, uh, Dan and Mount Hermon, as places of divine revelation, the uh, Testament of Levi, for example. Mm -hmm where he has taken up Mount Hermon and is given a revelation, uh, Levi, the, the son of uh, Jacob. So there was something about that region in that second temple period where uh, it was believed to have some sort of connection to divine revelation. But then, I mean, it would be easy enough for us to say, look, this is not in the Bible. We can ignore all of this, except that that's where John the Baptist was baptizing. Yes. And that's where Jesus was baptized. That's where Jesus, mm -hmm. that region between the Sea of Galilee and Mount Hermon, Galilee of the Gentiles, mm -hmm. is where Jesus chose to base his ministry, except for those few uh, road trips, if you will, to mm -hmm. uh, Jerusalem or to the region of Sidon and mm -hmm. Tyre. He, Mount Hermon, Transfiguration. Right. He was in that region for a reason. Yeah. And, well, uh, I, you and I believe that that is actually the location of the Valley of the Shadow of Death. It's a yes. real place. Right. The Hula Valley, mm -hmm. which connects essentially Mount Hermon and that region to 
Sea of Galilee. I mean, the valley comes out just before the, the uh, uh, around the ancient city of Chorazin, uh, just north of the Sea of Galilee. Chorazin, so. one of those cursed cities. Yes. And I wonder, because there's a big cluster of dolmens mm-hmm. right there. We're rabbit trailing now. But yeah. uh, again, this all re- re- relates to the cult of the dead, the ancient cult of the dead, and how they were to be venerated by the pagans who lived around ancient mm-hmm. Israel. And uh, this this ritual of pouring out the drink offerings for them to satisfy them. This this was yeah. a snare oh, yeah. to the Israelites for generations, oh, for so centuries. Much so. By the way, the other two cities that were mentioned in the curse. Bethsaida. Yes, and Cap- Capernaum. Yes, and all of those connected to mm-hmm. very much to the, this region um, where the cult of the dead. Very close to the Galilee. Right, Yes. right. So you've got the, uh, okay, well, this is, this is really interesting. They did not repent of their deeds. Uh, well, I'm jumping ahead to verse 10 here. Getting, well, getting they used don't. To really in verse, exciting they don't. Yes. In verse 9, they just do not. Clearly, there's an opportunity, but they don't. They don't take it. Um, and we're really getting into some of the meat of the exciting prophecies of the end times here. Revelation 16, verse 10 now. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Yes. And its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. First of all, pains and sores, that was the first vial, and it's still going on. Hmm. So, yes, things have been getting worse and worse for these people. They've got the boils and the sores. They've got uh, the, they've the got sun the suddenly turning hot. Beating and down on them, people. blood to drink. Yes. Blood yes. on the rivers, blood in the sea. And now a, a deep darkness. This, and, and as you mentioned, the fourth trumpet judgment uh, strikes about a third of the sun's light. Suddenly it scorches and now it goes completely dark. Well, it went from, I'm going to scorch you, yeah, yeah. to where to go. This judgment, the, uh, this, the, the fifth bowl judgment, is the first one that is directed specifically specifically at the spirit realm. Right. Humans on earth will be suffering because of the first four, but this one poured out on the throne of the beast. Yes. Um, this well. is really intriguing. This also corresponds, by the way, to another one of the plagues of Exodus, the ninth plague, which is the three days of darkness, Exodus 10 verses 21 through 23. Oh. So now God is sort of repeating that here, but the throne of the beast. By the way, rabbit trail again, uh, Derek and I are writing a book that we hope will come out toward the end of this year uh, in 2023. And it's tentatively called The Gates of Hell, but it's all about portals. Mm-hmm. And that can be a physical portal on this earth, um, or it can be something within our minds that we willingly open sure. up. But it's essentially communicating with the fallen realm. We are not supposed to do that. But when you do that, you end up in this place mm-hmm. where you, you end up being deceived and possibly having all of these poured out upon you. And the fact that these were poured out goes back, as you said, to Exodus. Now, what Derek and I are going to write about in The Gates of Hell is that, and it's something that Donna Howell has written about, Oh yes, that yes. threshold mm-hmm. is a whole lot more to the threshold than we ever imagined. It's not just that little space between outside and inside. Mm-hmm. It's so much more than that. And so this idea of bringing in plagues, the 10th plague, mm-hmm. the loss of the firstborn son, mm-hmm. the fallen realm insisted that you be willing to give up your firstborn child. Remember what Abraham was asked to do? Yeah. He didn't think anything about that because the fallen realm had been asking for that for a long time. Right. Right. Post flood, he was he grew up. He was soaking in it mm-hmm. in Haran. It wasn't until Moses later when God said, "Okay, we don't do this sacrifice to Molech no, anymore." No, no, we do not. Right. You you can pay the money to make up for it if you want to. There are other but ways. But not to Molech. But yeah, the sacrifice. Exactly. Yeah. You do not. God doesn't require that we sacrifice our firstborn ch- right, son. Right. Right. But what he was saying in Exodus mm-hmm. was, "Okay." Your gods have been requiring your firstborn son. You haven't been doing that. So because you refuse to repent and let my people go, I will allow them to do that. In fact, I'll send my own reaper. Mm -hmm. 
the angel of death will come through and he will only come in to protect those who have the blood. In other words, that marking wasn't to keep the reaper out. It was to allow the Lord in because that way he could protect them. Yeah. And there's more on that in the gates of hell, but yeah. boy. That's a, that's a really different teaching, kind of changes our understanding of what the purpose of the, the blood on the doorpost it was It really about. does, but it's a reminder what's going on here, that these people were not protected. They had no blood covering because of Jesus. They hadn't accepted it. They refused it, and they refused to repent. In fact, they cursed God mm-hmm. in this. Yeah. This is... Um, it's hard for us to imagine how stubborn, how how committed to rebellion against God you have to be. I can in spite see of it. all of these signs, especially because they will still have access to Bibles in that day. Now, probably the kingdom of the Antichrist will try to destroy these words so that mm-hmm. people won't have access mm-hmm. to them. But I am convinced that God will preserve it, oh, even for will. those in this time. The restrainer will be removed, and the Antichrist will set up his global kingdom. But somewhere, somehow, people are going to have access to these words if they if they really, really look. Mm-hmm. And yet, for the most part, the majority of the people on earth will not repent. They will curse God, even though even knowing that He's the one responsible. I know. I I I'm with you. I find oh. it hard to believe, but I have seen a coldness taking place in the world. And we can talk about that after the break, but yes, the world is growing very cold. Mm, That and uh, the drying up of the Euphrates River. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah, that's ahead on Unraveling Revelation. Prepare for spiritual war by arming yourself with information. Take advantage of these specials through March that dig deep into the Bible to help you make sense of the chaos around us. First, our Veneration Bundle, our two co-authored books, plus the travelogue DVDs from our Israel tours. An $85 value, just $45 plus shipping and handling. The Second Coming of Saturn Bundle, featuring my book and the 13-part companion DVD. A $50 value for just $35 plus shipping and handling. The This Is War special offer, featuring the Second Coming of Saturn, four DVDs, and seven hours of audio interviews with Bible scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, a $145 value for just $75 plus shipping and handling. And the Gilbert Fiction Collection, all eight novels in Sharon's Red Wing Saga series, plus my two novels, a $200 value for just $140 plus shipping and handling. These offers are available through March only at our online store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And again, we thank you for your prayers and support. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we hope that you're sitting there with your coffee or your whatever and and having maybe tea and uh, enjoying what uh, we hope is a good teaching. We try very hard to, uh, to, well, to make it as simple to understand because we're pretty simple ourselves and, (laughs) and help you to understand it. But we also recognize that the next time we come through here, uh, if the Lord allows us to teach on the on the idea of revelation and start mm-hmm. this whole series all over again, we're very likely to go, you know, we said this before, but uh, this is the extent to which we understand it today. Right. And, and as I said, the world is growing colder. Um, but yeah, the Euphrates is coming up and we will be in Israel. Mm-hmm. So we hope that you'll be going with us in March of this year. Yeah, we'll be showing you some of the sites where these prof- prophesied battles will take place, especially if you take the uh, optional three-day extension to Jordan, because we'll go to Mount Nebo. And from oh, there, yeah. you see what Moses saw when he got his only look at the Holy Land. But we'll explain while we're up there why God called Mount Nebo this mountain of the Avarim, mm-hmm. mountain of travelers, yes. and why that phrase is uh, refers to what Ezekiel prophesied in the War of Gog of Magog. Ezekiel 39, 11, mm-hmm. refers to the Valley of the Travelers east of the sea. That would be the Dead Sea. And uh, that's where that battle ends. 
Well, interesting, too, that Mount Nebo is probably named for Nabu, <laughs> yes. who was a god who, I would argue, along with Inanna, they're in charge of the world right now. Mm-hmm. Nabu is the god of mercantile, yes, uh, keeping records, yoking people to an economic system, and she is the god slash goddess of changing your gender, mm-hmm. you know, just do whatever you want to, do as thou wilt. That's, right. how, that's what her... Her now, mothers. we know that God ultimately is in control of all things. He but, is. Uh, remember, he Jesus is. himself he called is. Satan, the prince of this world, the God of this world. Uh, they're temporarily giving us control, have control of this. When Satan took Jesus up a very high mountain, Mount Hermon, mm-hmm. showed him the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll give these to you. They've been given to me. I can give them to whoever I want. Just bow the knee to me. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus didn't rebuke him and say, you don't have that authority. Um, but uh, he basically countered with the word of God. Praise the Lord. uh, Anyway, you can see Mount Hermon as well if you join us in Israel. Find out more information. There's still a little time left to get in for our 2023 tour, but we will go back in 2024. All the information always at gilberthouse.org slash travel. True, so true. Well, uh... Nod their tongues for pain. That's verse 10. Yeah. Kingdom full of darkness, and they nod their tongues for pain. This, again, this is really speculative here. Where would the throne of the beast be? Well, we could spend the whole rest of that on this because this is something you have really, really looked into. Mm-hmm. Now, I would I would argue at this point, the throne of the beast would be set up in Jerusalem. Well, presumably. Yeah. Yes. And sadly, um, I think those who are living in Jerusalem at this time, they are going to be subjected subjected to a lot of terrible events, but also eventually the War of Armageddon. Yes. And again, we can only speculate as to how we get from here to Armageddon. If if we look at Daniel chapter 11, which reads like the Wars of Antichrist, where he leads the, the figure described, the king of the north, the Antichrist figure, mm-hmm. leads Israel to smashing victories over nearby neighbors and then sets up his palatial tent mm-hmm between the sea and the glorious city, which would be Jerusalem. Uh, But then he falls with none to help him, which corresponds seemingly with Revelation 13 and the mortal head wound of one of the heads of the uh, the, the beast. How does he go from there to suddenly having to fight to try to take Jerusalem? Don't know. Could be that the people, that, that the Jews alive in this day suddenly realize we've backed the wrong man and we're going to take back the, the temple mount. I don't know. This is all speculation. We don't know for sure. All we know is that Armageddon is coming and that one of the precursors for it is the next bowl judgment. Yes, I think so too. Now, when he pours out his wrath, bear in mind it's upon the throne of the beast. Right. And it's his kingdom that's going to suffer. Right, right. Again, this is directed at the supernatural realm more than, uh, well, specifically, rather than the the physical realm. And I I agree with you what you said on the last program, that as in Exodus, those who are in his hand, who are not marked by the mark of the beast, but have the Lord's mark upon them, who believe in Christ tonight, they they are covered by his blood. Mm Mm-hmm. They will be supernaturally protected, yes. which will make them hated even more, just like in Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Why aren't these plagues hitting the Israelites? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Revelation 16, verse 12 now. This is one that's been attracting some attention, and this may probably be as far as we get for this Oh, week. I think so. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, this refers back to the um, the 200 million, the army of 200 million. Right. In, uh, was that Revelation 12? I uh, can't find that right now, so. Oh, uh, Revelation 9. Yeah. Um, our, our good friend, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, has a new book out called Kings of the East, which deals with China. And there are many who will look at the kings of the East and uh, interpret or assume that it must be China because only China could field 200 million in an army. We, we would argue that this is really a, uh, another judgment that is directed at the spirit realm, that the Euphrates River was considered a, a boundary between the land of the living and the land of the dead. Yes. And we argue this because even with 1.4 billion people, China's army cannot possibly get close to 200 million soldiers. There's like a 12 to 1 ratio of support personnel to soldiers. And uh, 
So if you've got 200 million soldiers, you've got to have 12 times that many in support for those soldiers to field that kind of an army. Nobody is going to field an army of 200 million physical, so unless, unless they are demonically possessed. And that's the point. We think that this is the army, the possessed, or the demonic army that will eventually come from the east to come at Jerusalem. But more than that, again, the Euphrates representing the boundary between the realm of the dead and the land of the living. Very much so. And the kings of the east, that is what's really important here. It's not saying all the individuals, it's saying the kings of the east. Mm -hmm. Now, the king, the kings, that's Besileus. That's the word that is translated kings there. That is the source for the word basilisk, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is a king reptilian spirit. Interesting. Reptilian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We've, so it's um, like dragons. We have written before in, in our books, uh, giant, in a book, Giants, Giants Gods, Gods and Dragons, and dragons specifically, exactly. yes, the, uh, the perhaps serpentine appearance of mm -hmm. some members of the uh, spirit realm. Um, the fact that the word Nakash, serpent, is used interchangeably in the Old Testament a couple of places with the word seraph, the mm -hmm. singular form of seraphim. So nakashim, seraphim, flying, fiery serpent, dragon. Yes. Yeah. So I don't think it's the Chinese. I think it is, as you say, I think yeah. these are the dead or maybe even those who have not been able to cross over because right now the demons can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the fallen angels who were put over the nations following the Babel event, they might be able to go back and forth between here and Hades. Mm -hmm. They can't get into Tartarus. Mm -hmm. Not right now. Right. That day is coming when Tartarus will be opened. Mm -hmm. That is the abyss, the opsu. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where we get into some of the uh, non-linear storytelling of the book of Revelation. Yeah. Because I would suggest that here in Revelation 16, the drying up of the river Euphrates, and, and by the way, we know that drought in the Middle East is leading to you, the Euphrates, the water level of the Euphrates dropping. Right. That is not, what's happening now in the physical realm is not this. No. There's no. a lot of bad stuff, as you've been hearing the last couple of weeks, to get through before we get to the <laughs> Euphrates drying up in fulfillment of prophecy. Um, and, and again, this is more of a supernatural change than a physical change. We're dealing with a demonic army, a supernatural army that is coming to do battle. This essentially is the precursor to the Battle of Armageddon. I agree, because that's coming up next. This mm -hmm. actually is linear in this way, but yes, we are leading up to that final moment in history. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior yet, now is the time. You need only recognize you're a sinner Ask him to come into your heart to cover you with his redemptive, redemptive blood. That is what changes you. And the Holy Spirit will come in and you will be brand new. You will be what is called saved. But the fact is you will now be a child of the true king, a child of the Lord creator of earth. Yes, and uh, saved out of all of this that we've been discussing. Yes. And we'll continue our discussion as we uh, lead up to the precursor, lead up to Armageddon and our study thereof here on Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.